um, but we welcome you online for this time in the Word. And if you have your Bibles, we want to draw our attention to the book of Acts. We are walking through the book of Acts, um, just having a great time in the Word. Um, I've been excited about just the things that God has been sharing with us as a body. Um, you know, we haven't been running our traditional announcements, but I just want to just give you a heads up. Just take a second look at your electronic devices to confirm that they are on silent. If you're using an electronic device um, for your Bible, um, just confirm that it's on mute um, so that we can keep the distractions to a minimum. However, Acts chapter 2, we've come as far as verse 21. We left off in verse 21. If you need a Bible, slip up your hand and we'll be sure to get one over to you. But we are in the beginning portions of Peter's sermon. Remember, the Holy Spirit had come upon the church there on the day of Pentecost. And there were those who were saying these were um, drunk. They were filled with new wine. However, Peter gave the correction, this is not that but this is um, that which the prophet Joel had spoken about. And so he begins to give an explanation of what God had done. The promise that God had given had been fulfilled. And so, you know, he refers to the crowd, he refers the crowds to Scripture in light of what Joel said in chapter 2 of the book of Joel. And here we see in verses 17 and 18, that was the things that were taking place presently. I remember um, as I ended the message, remember Pastor Greg taught last week, but the week before when we were in this chapter, we landed in verse 21, but I didn't spend um, enough time or I overlooked verses 19 and 20 because I really wanted to end with that verse in verse 21, you know, ye who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But we'll go back today for a minute and then forward and finish up in, and end today in verse 24. But here, look, understand this. That it, when I was in the third grade, I remember being in, in the hallway before school started, um, the entrance door, and, and I had my hand up on the doorpost as people were going in and out of the building, early morning kids coming in or whatever. And, and I recall as I was talking there, one of the people that I was talking to noticed that there was blood running down my arm. And I, I turned to look and I noticed that my finger, my right hand ring finger, um, there was this big split, but I had never felt the pain. I had never noticed that, you know, the door had slammed on my finger. I never felt it. And I don't recall whether at that time when I saw all the blood, did I panic, did I cry, or what. But I recall never feeling that pain until I went to the doctor, the hospital, where they rushed me to and... I received stitches in this finger, and today the scar is still there. And sometimes, I don't know why, but I just walk around and do this to my hand sometimes. But although what I see here in this is that my greatest need at that time was to be rushed to the emergency room so that my finger could be addressed and I didn't bleed to death or whatever you may. But I believe today God wants us to recognize our greatest need. And man's greatest need is for a savior. And here, understand this, in, in light of our lives, if you don't know Jesus today, this is what God wants to do. He wants to stitch you up. Your life has been broken. It's been broken and, and, and separated from God. You've been walking in sin. Today, God wants to stitch you up. And here, the reality is, you and I, as we've come into this relationship with him, he has stitched us up. 
He has put us back together. Even though the scars may still be there, you are able to walk in life today. You are able to go about life here even though those things are there. And we must know this for ourselves as well as we must boldly proclaim this to others. And so here, man's greatest need is a living relationship with Jesus Christ. We saw that God had through the prophet Joel spoken, and he said something there. He said, in the last days, he would do this. He would pour out his spirit on all flesh. We notice there in verse um, uh, sorry, 17, it says there that his sons and daughters will prophesy. It says the young men will see visions and the old men will dream dreams. We see in verse 18, the Lord said on his servants, male and female, that they in this day, in those days, would prophesy. So we see in the last days that there will be this great outpouring of God's Spirit. Now, what is this last days referring to? The last day period really is from the time that Jesus had come until the time that he returns. That's the window here. And I believe personally that we are living in the last of the last days. And so here, understand this. So we see these last days being spoken of, but we see that our greatest need, as we notice, as believers, as followers of Christ, is to be walking in the Spirit of God, in the power of God. In these last days, as believers, we are to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. God poured out His Spirit for the advancement, I believe, of his kingdom to proclaim the gospel, to share with others. Why else would God want to give us his gifts? It's not to glorify ourselves. We learned that. It's not about how spiritual and how righteous we are. But God has given us spiritual gifts to advance his kingdom, to proclaim his great news so that this world would see that there is a life that is transformed and that we can live in the power of his resurrection. And so here, look, understand, as we see this, as he has poured out these gifts, as he has given these gifts, we discover as we study the book of Acts, and we'll see this as we continue to go through it, that every vision, every dream that was given was not for personal purposes. What we see, it was rather for the witness and the reaching for a life lived in Christ. It was to reach people. It was to encourage people. It was to challenge people to come into this relationship. And so we also see that the gift of prophecy is being used to tell others of the very reality of God sending his only son into the world to save sinners from their sins. As long as you have skin, you're going to have sin. And as long as you're in this world, there are going to be sinners to be reached. And we can't forget that it's by grace that you and I have been saved. But we are sinners saved by grace. You remember even in the song we just sang, he, he said, man, that the, the grace was like just overflowing. That's God's grace, unmerited favor to you, towards you and I. But I wonder today... Have you been walking in God's outpouring of his Holy Spirit? Lately, have you been receiving revelation? Have you been, you know, recognizing his presence in your life? Have you noticed those things? How have, has what God revealed to you helped someone else draw nearer to Jesus? I can't answer that for you. I can answer it for myself and recognize how God has used me but if you cannot identify with any current revelation, something that God has maybe illuminated through his word to your heart, something that he has spoken to you in a dream or given you a vision in, hey, how has it helped someone else to get closer to Jesus? 
Here, this is something we must examine. But we look at verse 19 and 20, and we see there in 19 and 20, and we read it before, but it says, I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. And he says, blood and fire and vapor of smoke the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great day, great and awesome day of the Lord. Now I want you to notice there that there's a different statement in verse 17. It says the last days, we talked about that period, but here we're seeing here the great day of the Lord. When is that? That's the day that Jesus returns to the earth. And here at the end of the last days spoken of. But we see here, hey, there's a few things that we will notice in light of signs, if you may. It says that there will be wonders, signs, blood, and fire. And notice here, because when you look at the wonders, there's things that will occur that will highlight something that is out of the ordinary. I don't know if you've been noticing lately things that are a little different. You know, people keep looking for a time to get back to normal. Newsflash, guys. You're living in the new normal. There will never be a time where we will get back to normal. Those times are, are, are long gone now. And you need to make the adjustment in moving in the new norm in how God wants to use you in the midst of the new norm because God is the God today, yesterday, and forevermore. And so he knew this time is not a surprise. We just need to be sensitive to his leading of his spirit in these times. But there's some things that are happening that are out of ordinary. They're not the ordinary things of life that's been going on. There's been some signs, some things that will happen by the hand of God to give man warning that the end is near. There's some warnings out there, guys. You know, if you look and spend time in your word, hey, people are more lovers of themselves. That's what Paul said in his epistle that, hey, you know what, that men will be lovers of themselves. They will be boastful. They will be proud. They will be lovers of money. Hey, you know what, they will be kids that would be rude to their parents and authority. I don't know a, a worse time in history where children were more disrespectful to parents than this time. To authority than ever before. And so here, look, understand this. Hey, we must understand even as we see these signs and these wonders occurring, and then he talks about the blood and fire and vapor of smoke, there'll be terrible bloodshed that we see here spoken of. And watch this. And the fires that is spoken of is explosive fire. Oh, I don't know if you watched the news this past week. But what do we see in the great events that have been happening as of late? We saw in Lebanon, right, an explosion. I know I've never seen anything like that in my time period. They, they are comparing that to Hiroshima. You know, when you think about the explosion that happened, and, and you've seen the fire that went up, one, but then the ripple effect. And we see here, look, understand, this fire that's brought about, and we see these things occurring to give us warning about things that are coming down the pipeline. And so when we consider this, there's no order in the scriptures of how these things roll out. What we find, though, is how the scriptures are showing that there are warnings that will begin and we see that the scriptures even talk about birth pains that will happen. And so here, look, understand, our greatest need is to recognize our need. And I believe there's many people moving about life not recognizing their need for a living relationship with Jesus. But once we recognize our need and we recognize our need that Hey, you know what? As verse 21 says, once we recognize our needs, it says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You never call on anyone if you don't know that you need them. 
You won't call on the name of Jesus until you recognize your need for him. I remember a few years back, a young man in the community had got shot. And I went to visit him in the hospital. And I could never forget how in the midst of me talking to him, how he told me in that moment, in the moment when he was in that situation, when he was nearing death because his wounds were very tragic. Here, follow this. It said, he said this. He said, all I could think about is calling on the name of Jesus. Interesting. You see, because at that moment, he recognized his greatest need. And here we must understand and have we recognized our greatest need? Have you recognized your greatest need is Jesus? God wants to save and he wants to rescue you today. He wants to rescue you. And here, this great verse, I thought it was a great verse to remember, verse 21. It, it could be said like this, whoever recognized their needs and calls on the name of the Lord shall be rescued. Whoever. Don't forget that that name, that word there is for whatever person. Not who we think is qualified for the kingdom, but whoever God shows their need. Hey, you need me. Whoever. And here, so we see in verse 22, it says, as Peter goes on in his sermon, it says, men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourself also know him being delivered by the determining purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put him to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. We see in verse 24, it, as Peter said, even in verse 14, he called the crowd to hear his words. And now once again, he's calling them, hear these words, men of Israel. You know, we mentioned in times past that that word Israel means governed by God. Or he may be even speaking to the religious crowd. And he's saying, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth. And, and I find this interesting because he says he is a, a, he's a man. He's referring to the, 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 the man Jesus. And he's saying this, hey, he's from Nazareth one and that he's a man attested by God. In other words, he was approved by God. In other words, he was pointed out, if you may, or put on display or shown or even sanctioned and certified. By who? By man? By God. Here, I want you to see this because it was God who endorsed him. And there was the evidence shown by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did notice through him. That's how it was done. It was God working through Jesus. And he says this, it's right in front of you. It's right among you. It's in your midst. See this though. He says this. He says, and you yourself know. You're aware of this. You have knowledge of this. I, I, I just find this interesting because look at who Jesus is. He's a man of, um, from Nazareth. And if you remember, according to the book of John in chapter 43, we, I mean in chapter 1, verse 43 through 47, remember when Jesus wanted to go to Galilee and he found Philip. You remember that story? It says there, he said, he called Philip to follow him. And this is what happened. It says, now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, 
we have found Jesus or we have found him. But it says there, of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. This is how Philip communicates to these guys that, hey, we found him. We found the Messiah. And watch this. And Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Interesting. What a question. We said, yo, we got the Messiah. Anything really good come out of there? That's like years ago, we got a seven-foot center. Can anything good come out of Newark? Shaquille O'Neal killed the NBA. And look here. People will ask this question. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Can anything good? And this is the response. I love it. Philip said, this is what you do. Come and check it out. Come and see. If you don't believe anything good can come from this place, I'll tell you what. Come and see. I believe that's what God wants to do right here in this city. You can anything good come from the hood? Can anything good come from this urban community? Come and see. And you know who he's going to do that through? Vessels. Willing vessels where people think nothing good can come out of you, but great things are happening right in, through, and around your life. Here, look, understand this. It says, Jesus said to Nathanael, coming towards him, he said to him, behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. He's saying like, hey, you're not like Jacob, who was deceitful and conniving. He said, hey, you, you, you don't have that in you. You're coming genuinely. You're coming towards me. And he saw him coming and he embraced him. Come to Jesus, not with deceit. Not to, oh, you know, what's really going on out there? But really, hey, God, I'm here. I want to know. I want to see. Is there, is there something good that can be found in you? I'm here to find you in that very space. Here we see this desire. And look at what God can do when he begins to do a work in you. I, I remember... What it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it says we are his workmanship created in Christ for good works, which God prepared, watch this, beforehand. This is the key, that you should walk in them. And I wonder today, are you walking in the good works that God has prepared for your life? Hey, you are his artwork. He has created you to put you on display and as you and I walk in this place that he has prepared beforehand, we have the free will to choose to walk in that or not. Hey, are you walking in his plan for your life today? God has approved you. Just as he approved Jesus, that's all that matters. Has God approved you? There are too many of us walking around looking for the approval of man. God is calling us to be a people. Look, God approved Jesus' ministry. And he showed it through signs, miracles, and wonders. But look here. And this is the thing because we're saying, oh, you know what? That's what happened there. That's what has to happen with me. I tell you what. Did John the Baptist do any miracle? Go look in your Bible. Not one. But one of the things we know is that God approved his ministry. It wasn't long, but it was effective. And so we must understand this. Hey, we must see, hey, is God putting, on dus putting us on display? And for what purpose? It's not for us to get the shine. It's for him to receive glory. It's for his kingdom to be advanced. And we must recognize how he has called us and he wants to work through us, but he'll approve you. He'll approve of you as you come. And you continue to walk by the power that he has provided for you. Here, see this. Remember, Pastor Greg taught from 2 Corinthians last week, and he reminded us of something. He said, there's this 
treasure in earthen vessels. Remember that? Hey, you know what? You have a treasure in you. And I want you to see this because, hey, in verse 23, we see this, the gospel. The gospel is shown right there in verse 23. And I want to encourage you, as you go through serving the Lord and being a willing vessel of the Lord and you have this treasure, I want you to recognize this and, and, and really identify, are you seeking for the miracles or are you seeking for the master? You see, because when you seek for the master, you can find the miracle. But when you seek for the miracles, you may miss the master. And so I want us to be encouraged to follow Jesus, seek after him, and watch miracles happen in your life. Watch miracles happen around your life. Don't seek the miracles. Seek the master. And so here, look, in verse 23, we see this gospel being proclaimed. It says, in rewind for a second, he said he did this thing in your midst. And he says, and you yourself know. But then he goes on and he says, hey, the reality is this. You know him. And being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken my lawless hands. And he goes on. But notice what it's saying here. He's saying here, and, and I think it's good for us to remember this. Sometimes we forget the gospel. Sometimes we take advantage or, or kind of throw that in the back. But it's important that we remember that Christ died for our sins. You know, it's easy to second-handed, hey, this is for you. God died for your sins. But he died for your sins also. And it's good for us to remember the gospel that Jesus not only died for our sins, but he was buried and he rose again for our sins. And that you and me have the opportunity to walk in resurrection power. And so it's good for us to remember the gospel. But notice what it says here. It says it was by the determining purpose and the foreknowledge of God. In other words, it was God's appointed plan and intention. Watch this, though. I want you to see how the sovereignty of God works with the free will of man. Notice here how it says here that it was God's determining purpose. It was his plan. He foresaw it. But watch here. It says, but you have taken you have taken, notice this, this is your choice. You see, this is what's messed up about a lot of people today. They live and they think that their choices really were motivated by God. And so they say, well, it was already written. Meanwhile, they're doing whatever they feel like they want to do. But meanwhile, the reality is this, is that you and me have free will to choose whether we're going to walk in obedience to the Lord or if we're going to walk in disobedience against his will. And so here, see this, because he's saying here, it, God had a purpose and a plan. He didn't make Judas do this. He already knew what Judas would do. He didn't make the Pharisees be envious of Jesus. And here, look, understand this. As we see, though, it says, you Jews have chosen to take him and turn him over to the Romans, the Gentiles. I find this interesting because you think about the religious, the spiritual, and they're turning him, Jesus, over to worldly people. You know, it's interesting when we let worldly people dictate what God wants to do in us. Instead of letting God do what he wants to do. I wonder today, what are you doing with Jesus? What are you doing with Jesus today? What have you taken him and by your own free will given him over to the world to handle? When you consider this, hey, you see, it says it's by lawless hands. In other words, these are the people who are without law. They're, they're, they're outside the law. They're, they're above the law. You know, they're not yielded to the, the will of God. They're doing their own thing. But we take him and we say, here, you tell us what to do with this. 
And here, that's what they had turned Jesus over to pagan people in a sense. And so here, watch this. It says here, not only did you take by lawless hands, but you have crucified. In other words, you have fastened him to, we know it was a rugged cross. And it says he had put him to death. In other words, you killed him or destroyed him. You did away with him. But I wonder today, are you outside of God's boundaries like these lawless hands? Are you outside of God's boundaries because the truth of the matter is you want to do your own thing. And you won't even be real with yourself and say, I just want to do my own thing. But today, I wonder today, are you trying to live your life without guardrails? Look here. The reason why when you drive on a highway and there are the, the barriers and all of these stop signs and all of that is because there's guardrails in life as you're navigating because you know what would happen if you didn't have these things? Chaos. God's trying to put some guardrails on your life not to, oh, you know what, there's no life in this Christian world. No, it's we have liberty and freedom. We don't have to live under the law, but we have the freedom in Christ to live free from the bondage of sin and death. But I wonder today, are you even looking to God to govern your heart or are you looking to yourself for your own direction with a little mix of God. Look here, understand this here. As we see here, he's saying, hey, are you in a place where you're resisting to walk in God's ways? Doing what God has called you to do, allowing God to be in control of your life. God is calling you back to him. Are you trying to lock Jesus down in some specific place? What do you mean? Are you trying to lock Jesus down to your Sunday morning check-in in church and then when you leave out here, you just do your own thing? Or are you, you know, trying to lock Jesus down to some, you know, specific place in your house? But you don't give them everything. You know what? Oh, I, you know, I'm just going to get on my knees and I'm going to pray, Lord, thank you for waking me up you know, this morning, and then you know what, when you get up, you go about your way, you jump in your car, you listen to what you want to listen to, you have no conviction about the music that's influencing your heart and your mind, the radio talk shows that are influencing your heart and your mind, hey, the television goes on, you don't have any filter uh, of, of what's infiltrating your eye gate into your heart, hey, you know what, hey, that's living, crucifying Jesus confining him, locking him in to one place, but not willing to allow him to be free, to freely reign in whatever we do. Don't lock him up. Don't lock him up. Look here, watch this. It's saying here, as you consider this, if you're trying to lock him down, I want you to consider this. When you lock him down, you put him to death. When you lock your Bible down and you don't spend time in the presence of God, you know all that God has invested in you, you know what, you start to kill it. You start to not allow his conviction to be evident in your heart. You start to kill him and put him to death, to do away with him. That's what that put to death means, to do away with him. And so here, look, hey, is there these places in your life maybe that you're going when you're putting him to death? Maybe you're going to work and you have the light of Christ in you. But, oh, you put him to death because you're ashamed to represent him on your workspace. Maybe as you're in your neighborhood, you put him to death because you're ashamed of saying something that needs to be said. You feel him. He, you know, he's pushing up. No, no, no. I, don't, I ain't doing that. Look here. Is this you today? I want to tell you something. There's hope. Why do I say it's hope? It's hope for us today. 
Look at verse 24 with me as we come to a close. It says in verse 24, whom God has raised up and has loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. I think it's a powerful verse. They bound him. They turned him over to the Romans. They crucified him. They put him to death. But notice it said, God raised him up. You see, this is what sin does in our life. It binds us and it will put us to death. But I want you to know, God is able to raise you up today. You're feeling guilty. You're feeling dead. You don't feel a passion in your heart today. Maybe it's because some kind of sin in your life. I want you to know today, notice just as God did with his own be only begotten son in raising him, erecting him, that word could also mean raised to life. God can raise you to life today. I don't care what you've been involved with. I don't care if you, you know, been doing something nobody has a, a, a wind of or, or, or if it's right out there and you just, you know, you really don't have no peace. God can raise you up today. Here we see here, look, he says, having loosed the pains of death. In other words, he set free or to remove these things from you. In other words, it's, look, to go and do away with death. So he's loosed the pains of fatal illness. And what we see here, this term could literally be translated destroying the birth pains of death. Why? Because it was impossible that Jesus be held by it. Why wasn't it possible that Jesus be held by it? Held by what? Sin. You see, when they buried Jesus, there was no sin. So sin couldn't hold him in the grave. And so he was able to raise up again because he lived a sinless life. You see, every time you and me get involved with sin, it kills us. And we start to let it lock us up and hold us down. And now we're bound and now we're low and now we don't want to go to church, don't want to listen to the word, don't want to pray, don't want to worship. We don't want those things. Why? Because there's sin in our life. And we're supposed to be an empty vessel so that God can fill us with what he wants. But a lot of times we're filling ourselves with, we're drinking from two kinds of cisterns. God's saying, no. you feeling dead. You don't have no joy. You don't have no life. Look, it's real easy to see when people move through here where they've been at through the week. I don't have to hang with y'all during the week. But I can just see how you're moving. How can I say, well, you, you, you got them cameras out? No. I can see. Why can I see? Because you could just listen. And you could just identify. And you could just hear. And you could just see. Huh? I'm here. Why? Look, God wants to raise us up. Yeah, I know there, there may be some areas that God is, is putting his finger on right now. But look, he said it wasn't possible. It wasn't possible. That word is it, it, saying here that it wasn't capable or powerful enough to hold him. And I want to tell you today, because of Jesus, you could be set free. You don't have to be held in that space. Held by it. Seize the rest. There, that word held by also means to be controlled by. Are you controlled by sin today? Does this thing have power over you today? Here, look, I'm challenging us today. There is nothing, nothing that was able to hold Jesus back from the grave. And because of this same power that raised Jesus from the grave, it's available to you and I. Do you know that today? Here, look, follow this. What is it in your life? What is it? Not, 
that, that is holding you right now? Is there some relationship you're involved in that God doesn't want you in? Is it, is it some kind of, you know, secret sin? You know, where you're embracing something that you know by the Spirit of God that you should not be involved in that. You know, is it some phone activity? Is it some, you know, thing on the television? We don't know. I don't know. But you know what you're held by. You know what's holding you. Is it the lack of identity and you don't know who you are in Christ and you're holding on to other things and you're trying to embrace? What is, what is the it that has been holding you back? I want you to know because of Jesus, you don't have to be held by it anymore. God is saying, hey, give it to me. And you will see him set you free from that place. But it should no longer hold you down. And here as we land in this place, look, I wonder what is holding you back. Is it fear? Is it shame? Is it guilt? Here, look, consider this. What is holding you back? This is why you find yourself in that dead place that God wants to raise you up out of. And I pray today that you and I would recognize our greatest need is to allow God to raise us up to life again. God wants to raise you up today and because the Bible says, whom the Son says free is free indeed. Has he released you from your depression? Has he released you from that place? You know, here I wonder today because as we consider God's power, and this is what Peter must have recognized as he communicates to these people. He's, telling, he's giving them their greatest need. He's giving them Jesus. And he's saying, this is what you did with him, but you didn't have to do that with him. And as you continue to read through the sermon, you'll see some things that we'll come back to next week. But there is this sense that, hey, man's greatest need is Jesus. Do you recognize you need him to raise you up today? I wonder today as we close out, would you just spend some time before we run out and, and get on with the next thing, I wonder if you would just spend some time still before his presence. I don't know if they're going to play a song or whatever. We don't need a song. What we need is to hear the voice of God. And if God spoke to you about it, you need to deal with it. And so, hey, don't just grab it and go, but really... Cry out to the Lord. Cry out to the Lord in this space. Hey, if you need to come to the altar and cry out about it, you feel free to do that. If you feel like, hey, you want to sit in your seat and cry out about it, cry out about it. But look here, it is no longer any more time left for us to be held by it. Release it. And let him raise you up to new life again. Father, I thank you for your living word today. Lord, there are people, we are here today. And then there's things that's holding us. There's things in our childhood. There's things, Lord God, that people have done to us. There's things, God, that we have done to our own selves. And Lord God, you said that we can come to you. But, but we're, we're, we're shame. We're kind of like what Adam looked like in the garden. Trying to cover ourselves with, with fig leaves. When all the while you've provided a savior. You said in your word that before the foundations of the world, the lamb was slain for us. And Father, we thank you. And I pray, God, that your saints would be encouraged today. I pray for anyone that has yet come to know you, that they would say yes to you. I pray that as people are listening on the stream or 
on the radio, that there would be a true sense of repentance. And Lord, that they would be reminded that they no longer have to be held by it. That we would recognize our greatest need is Jesus. I thank you for mercy. How I know I need your mercy day by day. And I pray today that we would be still before you right now, wait upon you, and that we would turn it over to you. Have your way among us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.